Um, and so, um, without any further ado, I am very pleased to announce uh, uh, our first speaker of the day, a colleague of mine, uh, just downstate for that matter, at the University of Miami, uh, Brian Mapes. He actually um, comes to us uh, through quite a, a history. Um, actually, I didn't know you were a chemist, a chemist actually, at uh, Caltech. Um, uh, back in the 80s, uh, you, you got your BS and a PhD in the atmospheric sciences at the University of Washington, where I think you worked with uh, Dr. Dr. Howes. Um, and actually, he has interest in climate, tropical weather, deep convection, scale interactions. But today, Brian's going to talk to us something a little more germane um, to the work, uh, as far as the workshop's concerned, on building collections of resources with lasting value. Brian? Oh, do I uh, just plug it in here? I can plug this thing in, right? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Just the well-behaved Mac. That's all right. Well, good morning. Speaking of too much material in PowerPoints, I'm pleased to be here today. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so uh, this presentation that I will uh, present, which has some magic URLs and stuff, maybe it's worth uh, downloading or having. It is in the, um, this is the Ramada of this meeting. So if you went to the, uh, the uh, meetings Ramada, workshop Ramada, that takes you here and you can find this, uh, uh, let's see, yeah, yeah. You can find this under Tuesday. So all right, there we are. Um, uh, I, lo I love uh, the data age. I was just having breakfast down the road 20 minutes ago, Doc's Diner, and uh, here's my uh, horoscope for the day. Begin a two-day study period of study and research. Analyze the basic structure. Your wanderlust is getting worse. Man, they have my number. Uh, a conflict with authority could arise. Take it easy. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, pulling ahead from that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, I guess the theme of this and the theme of a lot of my uh, thinking these days is um, uh, this is probably a midlife, uh, midlife uh, kind of thing many of you might understand. You know, what are we, what are we doing here? What's, uh, what's, what's going to last as the sands shift under us? Um, and uh, so this is where I'm going to talk to you about a little bit, a few reflections on yesterday, maybe a tart joke or two just to wake everyone up. And I mean no hard feelings to anyone, of course. Uh, I hope that's obvious. Uh, and then we'll launch the, how many of you, uh, everybody installed the IDV as you were instructed to do? Yay! So we will launch it and kind of get it going, and I'll get you uh, plugged into my plug-in. Um, and, and then I'll talk about me and what this is all about, and then, uh, and then we'll just go back to, you know, the hand, end up with the hands-on. So the hands-on is a little bit fractal here. We'll start with it, because I know you're going to be multitasking. I want you multitasking on my IDV, not multitasking on Facebook. So. So I'll get you started on that right away. And then um, uh, there's only one final rumination. That's what, that's what you get after you chew cud too long. Um, all right, so uh, reflections on yesterday. Um, I get the feeling that the, uh, that the, bot, that the um, center of mass of Unidata users is shifting a little bit from retail to wholesale. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, uh, that's just an observation, I guess. There's more of like a business-to-business, B2B feel here to all this. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of uh, data handling and processing in the chain kind of uh, tools. And uh, really, that's often been, well. That's been the great strength of unit. I mean, uh, from net CDF onward, uh, that you know, useful bulletproof middleware has been a, a staple for sure. Uh, but so I'm going to be a little more on the user end here today, talking to you about their flagship, the IDV, which we didn't hear a word about yesterday, hardly. Uh, a lot of this is very oriented to textual programmers and programmer scientists. That's who this room is full of. It's a savvy customer base, high level. It's fun to. Uh, geek out together in that way, but uh, but maybe we're not the whole community, and we should not forget that. And uh, the m dissemination model's got a little bit of a loading dock feel still. People just you know making a nice thing and just tossing it up, and you know uh, packages are piling up. All right, so um, just some uh, you know a uh, bit of wisdom uh, for about the community and how software um, works. You're always going to have your enthusiasts and your early adopters. They're out there patrolling everything. Uh, your current users at any given time will include some of those, but be uh, some larger thing. And so your current users will al always have a, a little core of longtime users. The question I'm getting at here is whose interests are going to drive the direction of the project? And there's always the longtime users, and they're treasured, and there's always the current users, and they're 
uh, treasured. And, uh, but uh, not to forget, there's this ocean of potential users out there. And uh, we should not forget them, even though they're not in the room yet. Or maybe we don't even know them or how to even talk to them quite. Uh, here's a little tart uh, thing about, <laughs> so the, the, this is a, a great old classic, 1998, how long is that ago, 17 years, uh, The Onion, um, <laughs> anyway, new $5,000 multimedia computer system, downloads real-time TV programs and displays them on monitor, with a few reasonably priced add-ons, you'll never have to watch TV on a television again. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, they, so we have a taste for, uh, you know, throwing out <laughs> things that work perfectly well and, uh, Going to the new thing, but uh, but uh, there's also uh, the, the counter side. No, I'm going to pick on um, the QT again. Uh, nothing against Ryan, of course, but uh, um, this is a pet peeve of mine. Aerological charts were devised so that measured quantities like pressure, temperature, and wet and the temperature of a wet thing, uh, a thermometer, could be plotted in a nice temperature and pressure plate space, and then the quantities of real physical interest could be read off and conserved in parcel sense and things along these weird curved background axes which were used to encapsulate these nonlinear thermodynamic laws which users didn't want to always have to compute on their slide rules in 1904 or whatever, right? So this is why we have these weird diagrams. And now that any user can easily compute any thermodynamic quantity of interest, we're still struggling to build the old crutch in new languages. And uh, anyway, it just amuses me, I guess. And uh, oh, okay, I digress. But here's the here's the right way to look at the uh, column of uh, thermodynamics of the atmosphere. I'll claim this is pressure. That's mass. That's proportional to mass. Don't we care about mass physically anyway? Uh, these are specific energies. It's energy per unit mass. So area on this diagram is really energy in the real thermodynamic sense, unlike a skew to you, which is only one weird kind of abstract unrealized energy is the actual diagram. And column water vapor, you see how much of it's piled really in the lower troposphere. You get lots of detail in the lower troposphere. That's very important. Oh, and the moist adiabats are vertical, so parcel just goes up instead of up. Oh, is that up the dash dotted reddish green line that curves or what? So, uh, so I like that. And uh, here's, a, here's the same sounding on two different things. And uh, the top half of a skew T, in fact, the whole upper quarter is basically used to show you exactly how dry this little sliver of the atmosphere is. <laughs> You know exactly how dry dew point depression, and uh, anyway, so that's my pet peeve, pet peeve on this QT. Uh, but but uh, okay, but I digress. Let's uh, let's do some hands-on as the comments requested. Um, you all installed, I hope. Uh, no screenfuls of gibberish to stare at while it installs. No magic lines that you have to cut and paste from a GitHub fork, whenever that is. Uh, productized. This is a lovely productized software. All right, so let's launch it. Everybody got it launched? I'm going to make a patrol around the room, make sure everyone has launched. Better not look at the Facebook page. Mr. E. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Launch it. Yeah. When the red flags go. Now I get a syntax error. There. Lovely professional bit of software. Uh, so here's how I've learned to think about the IADV. Kind of, uh, and I've learned this the, the hard way, hitting my head a lot. That's why it's flat up front here. Uh, the IADV is, uh, I think it is, uh, you just have to take a breath. It's complicated. Read menus. You know, th every one of those words was slaved over and churned over. And, it could, you know, that is, those are the right words. Trust me, all those words in all those menus are the right words. And um, in a way, just kind of think like a maker. How does it work? Well, it works how it would have to work in order to do what it does. And, um, and um, so, so there's a little bit, just a little bit of patience here. And uh, I guess my old uh, stepdad in the taught me shop would say, measure twice and cut once. In other words, make sure before you click that button uh, that you're doing what you wanted because there's no back button. Like, like a buzz saw, there's no back button. <laughs> <laughs> There's a kill switch though, and you can start over, but then you've lost whatever. Okay, uh, so it's a it's a it's not a toolbox, it's a workshop, and uh, yeah, there's a back room over there where uh, it's still useful things there, but maybe they're not quite where the stencil says they are or something. Okay, so it's complicated. So the first critique often is uh, it's complicated, but again, everything was created and named thoughtfully. 
in a more a decade or two of, of really architecture and engineering, uh, oh, and some programming to implement it. And um, just to remember that that's a lot, <laughs> that's the, in, a way, in some ways that's the work, or that's the, that might be what's more lasting if it doesn't get undermined by a fad. Um, all right, so uh, tools, another thing I like is so many things, but actually they're available in one. If you need a hammer, it's in both uh, this place and that place. There's two hammers, or it's the same hammer in two drawers. Uh, and also uh, there's a lot of functionality hidden under right-clicking if you have a mouse or um, control-click. So uh, cowboy, get a mouse, uh, I recommend. But uh, you can do everything without it, but uh, all right. So the first intro, I'd say you've got two windows, right? Everybody got two windows. And a third one full of tips that you can get rid of. One's called the dashboard. One's called the display window. And you might have more than one display window. And, um, and those are the elements of everything. Uh, the display window is most of what you spend most of your time staring at. It has all these parts, which you could learn from the help system, uh, has this diagram. There are menu bars and toolbars, main toolbars, and a viewpoint toolbar, viewpoint. Uh, there are view menus, which are associated with this kind of display. You can tell they're inside the window. There's a legend, um, which has these checkable boxes for all the different displays. And uh, if you learn all those words, now you can read the help, and now you can, uh, if needed, interact with the, with the the help system, so useful. And um, less and less do I uh, always worry about uh, running out of memory, uh, but if there's a secret Easter egg, which is uh, if you toggle the GMT clock, it goes back and forth to a memory counter. And that used to be more crucial than it was. I think memory's just gotten better. Uh, at least I got a newer laptop. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, as usual in most software, the upper left corner has just uh, is the juicy spot, so you end up drifting your eyes uh, up and left. So. The file menu, of course, opens things and, and uh, saves things, so that's really how you pop in and out of your projects. Um, this little funny little game controller is to open the dashboard. If you accidentally close the dashboard, and you forget, you, this will pop it back. And then these, um, the other thing is if you get a, end up zooming and rotating and stuff, get all lost in there, this uh, cube with the blue on the top, that just takes you back to outer space looking down on the Earth, if you're, down, if you're burrowed into the atmosphere. And you can view this from the, this three-dimensional, you can view from the east and the south and the north, and you can rotate and things. So some of these things are useful uh, on the left. And the view menu has often, you know, the, f the final thing you want, which is capture images and movies. Uh, so that all lives in this upper left corner, and uh, just spend most, most of your time is going to be up there. And yeah, if you lose the dashboard, you can pop up another one. Uh, there's three kinds of help. Uh, this is what I tell, you know, just empower you. There's a reference manual, which is also just what you get under the help menu of the IDV itself. There's these tr uh, workshop trainings. Many of you have taken them. How many of you have taken a workshop training on IDV? Tiny fraction. All right. I'm not totally boring everyone here. Uh, and then there's starting to be more and more uh, screencasts, which is the modern, you know, these kids can't be bothered to read anymore. Uh, and neither can I. <laughs> Actually, my eyes aren't, uh, anyway, there's no need to. All right. So, um, so I've taken this training, I uh, come away thinking, um, oh, flipping software training. No, I, I, come, I come away thinking, I wonder if I could flip the software training in a useful way. And again, back to this uh, you know, shop analogy, uh, which experience makes woodworking more fun? Uh, build a birdhouse, it's fun to enjoy, uh, blah, 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 by the third paragraph, unless you frustration art. Uh, you can tell the frustration's already creeping in here, right? And that is, uh, that's what, that is building a birdhouse, uh, from boards, yeah, that's my new favorite animation. So that's uh, that. So that's that's kind of the way a lot of software training goes, and uh, and uh, this this is the way I'm trying to shift it. Uh, this thing is free. Let's replace parts so you can learn to build your own from scratch later, uh, as you get better and better at replacing the windows and the eaves and whatnot. So let's try that. Let's uh, launch the IDV, and we'll pull down this uh, Mapes IDV collection, and we'll look at the unit data example. And uh, for some of your regulars can fish, fish around and spread the load if you want to. So, so you'll see over here, of course, you have this lovely um, you know, set of templates, uh, data sets, current weather bundles, classes and labs. Man, this is, and some of this we're building into a textbook. Over, and uh, that's just, uh, you know, you can just build libraries and folderize those libraries. It can really be a, a library. And, uh, 
And so that's really wonderful, and I'd uh, invite you to start the UMUT Data 15 example. But uh, what's that you say, friends? There's, you don't have this folder in your toolbar? How many of you don't have that folder in your toolbar? Almost everyone doesn't have that in there. Why wouldn't you want that? Why wouldn't you want that to be there every time you launch this thing? Why wouldn't you want to? So uh, if you wanted to, <laughs> you could uh, load a frozen plugin for today's session only. Uh, if you wanted to, you could uh, have today's plugin launch every time you go forever. It, you know, it's not perfect, but it's good. Uh, but what you'd really, I suspect, rather have is um, a self-updating plugin every time you launch it. And as I make this better and better year after year, every time you launch it, you've got the latest thing I got around to, at least. And I try to make it only better and better, not regrettably uh, different. So, um, so let's assume you want to do this thing. Um, it's a weird little trick uh, that I got from Don Murray. It's a little one-two thing. You get confused between the layers here, but um, it's really kind of a meta plugin made of two files that you stash on your computer. And that meta plugin, every time you launch, it uh, fetches a jar plugin from my URL in Miami. And uh, so, so you just install these two files, and then every time you launch, you, it queries Miami, and my latest uh, version is there. And the way to find that, the easiest way to find that, I was going to give you a magic URL. It's easier to say, just web search MAPES and IDV in a browser. And I better do that just to make sure I'm still the top hit. Someone hasn't started a company that uh, sweeps me away. Oh. Yeah, look at their IDV plugin. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's that thing. There's some screencasts. At the, oh, th you can tell what amateur business this is. The guy who barely learned enough HTML to make the background blue <laughs> and center some of the text and put a hyperlink here and there. But uh, so, the, so the thing you're going to do here is take these two files, idv.properties and mapes.rbi. Two files, I'm sorry, not one file. I could make a zip and make you unzip it, but it's just easier to think of two files. You just download them with a the right click. You're a pretty savvy audience. And um, you have to stash them in this special directory this special directory. And this special directory will only exist if you have launched the IDV once. So, but you all made, I made you all do it. So you did, so you have it. And notice that it starts with a dot, dot unidata slash IDV slash default IDV. And uh, sometimes that's a little complicated. You gotta use a command line, which scares some Mac users. Wish this were one iota easier. <laughs> uh, probably some PC users, well in a PC uh, in the, Explorer of a PC, you, the dot files show up, so you can, yeah. So you just put those two files in that folder. Anybody having any trouble with that? Oops, my latest red ink paper. <laughs> uh, all right, so, uh, so if you do that, um, if you, that, that would be count as installing. And then all you gotta do is kill your IDV and start it again. And um, now you will indeed have Unidata 15 example zip uh, under the MAPES IDV collection folder, which will be in your toolbar. So I'm gonna walk around and see if anybody didn't get that and why. Excellent. Yeah, I should have put this link from somewhere else probably. Yeah, but uh, you know, web search, sometimes it's easier to say, type two words in the Google search instead of give a URL. Yeah, you, uh, I, go, I go back and forth. 
I'm super lazy, and I don't know which of those is the more lazy thing to do. Uh, all right. So let's suppose you did that. Oh, I better do it too. And I wonder how this, oh, we'll all hit it at the same, well, we won't hit it quite at the same time because uh, people <laughs> have different speeds. Uh, some defaults, I said except defaults, didn't I? Yes, except those defaults. Ah, bangity boom. It looks like a 500 millibar trough approaching Florida with a surface low pressure center in it. That green dot is the sounding profile which you get to move around. It's QT I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it is called, it's the top thing, Unidata 15 example zip. It actually exists somewhere else further down that folder. I just brought it up to the tip. Because those menus within menus, if, especially me nervous with twitching hands, those menus within menus would kill me if I was trying to do them live here. But this case, will, I'll put this case under um, uh, training example bundles. Uh, unless I end up refolderizing, renaming and refolderizing the whole darn thing one of these days. Um, I'll, I'll stash it in there for perpetuity. That seems obvious. All right. Um, so maybe, yeah, now you're all multitasking on the IDV. That's good, I hope. Anybody stuck? Should I roll on? Oh, but he's on the case. OK. All right. Uh, OK, so let me talk about, the, let me talk for a while while you play. Um, where did I come from? How did I get to be all interested in all this stuff? Um, as a graduate student, uh, I'm just I was, I'm dating myself. I had the night shift on the first scarce Unix machine in our computer lab. The, the postdoc had it from 9 to 5, and I got the rest of the 24-hour clock. And um, there was no software. There was a C compiler, and the printer knew, for, knew PostScript. And uh, I learned how to uh, take some pixels and put them on the color screen, color screen. Uh, but otherwise, it was, uh, you know, there's your fortress, there's your C compiler, enjoy. And uh, so airborne Doppler radar, the plane is moving through space. It's rotating in three dimensions. It's slicing in, in a corkscrew vertical profile. And those, so the radial velocity toward the, toward the airplane is some radial velocity toward a moving thing. And you're trying to estimate something meaningful about the time evolving weather around and through which this airplane was flying. Uh, so, I, so I gained a little bit of a you know, bitter pride of what bloody hard work that was. And uh, you know, I was, just to tell you, I was a code monkey in my day. Uh, to, you know, <laughs> in my era, I was a real code monkey. Um, all right, so, uh, but then along came, you know, along past graduate school, I discovered these interpreted language with integrated graphics. Yay, I mean Python, but, uh, but really, it, it started, you know, a long time ago, and it was S at that time, now called R, which I consider an obvious leap forward. Um, and IDL, I invested in IDL because it was free here at CU, and MATLAB's like that. And now, okay, Python is becoming the free thing that does as much as these things have done for... 10, 15 years, and I'm all for free, and that'll be good. But uh, these have some tending because they are commercial. I don't, I don't know how to go between uh, they cost money, but they are tended. And, I do, and uh, Python is uh, you know, burgeoning with uh, community energy, but uh, a little bit of a thick a wilderness <laughs> sometimes. Uh, and grads and NCL, of course, are also a thing. So, so with all these, I felt like I could build a career. I could outrun my competitors in science in a way and uh, and I could uh, just you know do a lot and uh, made myself a career and here I am in midlife all set uh, now uh, now my eyes are tired I'm tired of staring at code um, and you know is coding the only you know is it code or die is the future of work really must it be um, and uh, the, the, the counterweight against that really and what brought me to Unidata was was teaching I teach a first year graduate class, which is uh, you know, applied data analysis. This is really for graduate students so that their theses have good standards of evidence is what I, what I wanted. So clearly that's a coding uh, class. No question about that. Then the only question is what language, and I've been doing it in MATLAB because uh, everyone has it, but uh, would like to update to Python in principle, except uh, I am training graduate students and their advisors 
all use MATLAB, and all the codes there are going to be handed to do a PhD on our MATLAB codes. And if I teach my little boutique course in Python only, uh, I'm not sure. And MATLAB has these notebooks and everything. So, so I'm still not sure whether I will overthrow MATLAB for Python, if only because of the interests of my constituency, my fellow faculty who have this legacy of code in whatever language. So in a way, we all get cemented into the past. Fun as the new thing is, we all get some in the past. But uh, the, the counterweight to that is that I also teach for undergrad seniors a weather analysis course. And so that, you know, data is our currency. But really, is coding a prerequisite for, me, for a meteorology degree? Must it be? I, you know, maybe, and that's the right job preparation. And of course, we should teach our students coding, more coding and stuff. But, uh, but I just don't want to say that it's, uh, you know, at, that uh, absolutely. There, so I thought, uh, you know, maybe in the world of software where the out outer surface is soft, uh, maybe it's finally ready. And in 2012, I guess, I set, um, set aside my old cowboy coding pride, to, you know, to heck with them if they can't write a line of code. Uh, and I invested a ton of time in learning the IDV and getting good at it, slapping my head many times, uh, many critiques of uh, elements. You know, I've ironed out quite a few bugs in my day, as the unit data people attest. Made them iron out a bunch of bugs. Um, and now I'm trying to make that last, make that count for something. So my uh, critique, not even a critique, uh, well, you know, what can you say? Powerful software, a new language uh, or something, you know. It's powerful. Be in, in the software world, powerful means you can do a million things. But it turns out 999,900 of those are gibberish. <laughs> and, um, and many of them are actually, in this case, pitfalls. You know, you click the button and you go, oh no, you know, with spinning wheel of death, start over, lost my work, blah, blah, blah. So, so powerful software is like a powerful uh, buzz saw in your, uh, in your uh, workshop. You know, don't keep your hands out of there. Um, OK, and so I think there's a need for this kind of user-oriented upper middleware. And, you know, and um, uh, that's possible through this plug-in extensibility. So you know, the design and architecture of the IDV was there will be these plugins that people can craft that change every aspect of it, the skin and the menus and the and you know, stash and little favorites toolbars in everybody's toolbar. So it's you know, build collections and libraries. You know, the, this plug-in uh, aspect was you know, brilliant hard work behind the scenes to make possible a bunch of stuff that uh, that I'm now just uh, you know, out of almost out of gratitude, uh, feel like I got to do right by. So uh, so that's not just programming. That's That's engineering in service of architecture. And uh, yeah, I'm not seeing that in Python world quite yet. Um, all right, so uh, what are resources? I, again, I'm thinking kind of an upper middleware here. You know, it's a catalog, if you know what a catalog is. It's a bunch of bundles, like you're all playing with, which are, uh, which are a set of displays and data. You know, it's a whole state of the application. Um, data sources. Somebody was saying yesterday, well, there are all these great URLs out there to concatenate it, you know, SST daily forever. Somewhere, where is that? Where, where is that? Well, it's under data set and bundles, and it's got a label uh, because it's a bundle rather than just a URL that some, somebody gave you. <clears throat> uh, formulas, uh, boy, the, uh, the kind of the, uh, the frontier of IDV is it doesn't really do enough analytics in certain areas, and so I want to be able to build that out. Without having to write the deep down the whole Java behind it, you can build out the analytics, I hope, in. Uh, Friendlier ways. I'm trying to do that, and uh, and a lot of things that I would ca characterize as just a visual and scientific grammar. It's kind of a set of practices uh, that, you know, I just wish, uh, you know, color, yeah, has a lot of implications. All right. So the front face is this curated collection that you've seen of bundles. You could also see that in the catalog view of the IDV if you know where that is. And uh, you, can, you can also view this through a browser. So this is also, this whole collection also lives on a, it's got a browser portal as well. Many of you know that. In fact, that's a, a useful aside, I think, to say I love uh, the ability with this Ramada to have uh, exposed to IDV, exposed to catalog uh, clients, exposed to a browser. Uh, a whole collection of material. So I have a you know 50 100 terabyte machine or something. Unidata bought the machine. Thank you, Unidata, for the uh, for the machine and for helping set it up. And uh, you know as a demonstration. And uh, 
So I keep my bundles on it, which is 0.01% of volume. But also, you know, there's data sets on here, and you can see this little icon. Those are just server-side files. If you just have a Linux server and you've got your files in some directory, you go to this web interface and you create an entry to server-side files. You type the name of the directory that those files are in, and it's exposed as a catalog. And if anything in there that's a CDM file, a common data model, a NetCDF, or GRIB, or any of those things, uh, are served with services. You can subset them, you can see the metadata, you can, uh, you can even make plots if you set it up in a certain way. So you can, you know, students can plot with a web portal out of giant data sets. And all that is just, it's the data sets that are already spinning on your Linux disks. And all you gotta do is kind of expose them out through this thing, uh, which needs a special channel through the firewall and things. There's just a few things. So some of you, if I remember, um, some of the, what, what are you all here for was a few of you said, well, we have a ton of data and we don't know what to do with it. One thing you can do with it is just share it with the world by running an interface that uh, you know, shows it and serves it, uh, serves it out. So I love the Ramada. And I love the IDV Ramada uh, interface, as we'll see, which is how I published all those bundles that you're uh, working with. All right, so, so that's the front face kind of is, um, is all that, but, uh, but I've tried, you know, there's so many areas I can build uh, depth, I guess. One is color tables. I did not love the standard bunch of color tables, and you can get some others. And, but anyway, I like having a little curated collection. I, you know, so often I'm looking at diverging quantities centered on zero. And, uh, and I'm a big fan of transparency. Wherever you see this um, black and white thing, instead of having white between your blue and red, you can have transparent between your blue and red, and then you can see the stuff behind it in a 3D display. So that's pretty, that's pretty nifty. So, and uh, you know, I'm trying to decide what, you know, what, what does a library of color tables look like. I think there's linear, I think there's diverging. I think you sometimes want long, uh, you know, multi-hue, you know, long range kind of things. I don't know what else. Welcome any suggestions. I, yeah, I would love to have suggestions. Also trying to build out the analytics a little bit. So to shout out to Sue Varchal here, if you go to your formulas, in the dashboard under data sources. And uh, so far only grids have I added anything to, but looky there, the, you know, the MAPES collection is with you. And among it is uh, this kind of fun uh, thing. If you have CDO installed on your machine, if you don't know what that is, don't worry. You can call it sort of through the IDV and it'll do things, you know, analytics, correlations, covariances, uh, filters, <laughs> temporal filters, you know, anything CDO does you can kind of, uh, you know, just tunnel out, tunnel out and have that done. So maybe that's a nice model for, instead of building a bunch of Jython, uh, just sort of tunnel out to uh, other things. Um, and I've also exposed a bunch of the formulas that are already in the IDV. There's a lot of formulas in there that just weren't exposed, so I just pulled them out. The Q vector, I don't know if you know, the frontogenesis function. All these complicated bun bunches of derivatives and stuff, products, sums of products of derivatives. Those are all in there already and from Gempack. Somebody was complaining about it the other way. We're gonna get lost. All I had to do is just uh, expose them in the GUI. I didn't write any of these, uh, just expose them. So, uh, so anyway, what I find though is that, uh, and uh, Doug's been a great help, curation is hard at a concept level. My father was a librarian and uh, I'm uh, starting to realize, you know, Dewey of Dewey Decimal, a, a towering genius of taking all of human <laughs> um, knowledge and sort of, giving it a linear set of numbers or something, or you know, whoever, these categorization, categorization's just hard. Um, um, and it's, uh, it's way up, uh, it's not down in the code. It's, um, it's like architecture maybe a little bit, or so I uh, flatter myself. You have to know the whole stack of tools but not be driven by the tools. And uh, you're trying to be authoritative in the domain, in the final domain of, the, of what it's all for rather than just, uh, just a tool broker. Uh, so I think you need to be selective and opinion. At that point, I think it's you know, only honest to put your name on it. So this is why I have a personally named branded thing. I've thought about that. It's not because I'm. Uh, it's not because I'm really. Uh, you know, want my name on people's lips. I just uh, if I, if this if this was just called the blah blah plugin or you know Miami plugin, but it's only me. I just wouldn't get around. To, I wouldn't feel the hot seat of trying to keep it up or make it good. And you wouldn't trust it as much, and you shouldn't because it would decay like so many other things. Uh, little bit. So, um, so I'm trying to be audience oriented, but then the question is really always, who is the audience? Who, are the, who is the clientele? And am I, am I aiming at some potential users and do they exist? Or am I just, you know, 
missing the actual users that are, uh, could have been my actual audience. You don't know until afterwards, I guess, and um, so that's what I'm uh, wrangling with. So let's go back. Uh, let's go back and play with the IDV uh, a little bit. Let's see. Uh, you've all maybe perhaps noticed. Oh, it's three-dimensional. The sounding is where it is. The satellites kind of fun. You know, they're, they're, everything else was model grids, but the satellites real. You can. It's a little dangerous here uh, being on the off the rocker. This is where the uh, blue top cube, or the home, uh, home icon, sort of help you uh, get back to where you need to be. Yes. I said get a mouse, but it uh, doesn't really help. Yeah. Um, Vorticity. Some, okay, let's talk a little meteorology. Vorticity. Yeah, vorticity. So the the, the black uh, lines with the trough in them are, uh, you know, kind of streamlines of the mid-level flow. If I turned on the wind barbs, you'd see that that's the 500 millibar wind. So there's a trough in the 500 millibar wind uh, is the way to explain it. In, um, heights and winds terms, but that the secret uh, DNA, the secret skeleton of that trough is this uh, kind of band of vorticity, which I, I like kind of these lurid um, plastic colors for abstract quantities like vorticity, but this little band of vorticity is really why there's a trough in the, you know, these are the bones and that's the flesh. And um, so I wonder if we could make, uh, uh, so that's absolute vorticity. What if we wanted relative vorticity? You know, of course, you could find it probably if you went to the field selector, field selector in the dashboard. If we're going to make a new display, uh, this is the weird uh, file we're looking at. There probably is relative vorticity. Oh, actually, there isn't really relative vorticity. And sometimes you want um, geostrophic relative vorticity. So that's really just the Laplacian of the height field. You know, that's something you have to recognize, a little Laplacian of height field. So um, let's see, under my basic math here, uh, look at there, there's a Laplacian operator. You know, instead of having to try to take two derivatives in two directions and add it all up and write a code, uh, there's a Laplacian. Let's make a Laplacian, uh, let's make a Laplacian uh, thing. And uh, if I, I could just hit this and it'll make it with some uh, grayscale or something. But you know what, under these settings, uh, I kind of I have a collection here of uh, you know, recommended settings for various fields. So let's see, do I, and I don't like how they're all refolderized. They, uh, soon I'll make them better. Atmosphere. Uh, do we have vorticity? Uh, you can take an absolute vorticity. Doesn't matter. Sure. Okay. Just uh, instead of getting a default color scale and range, we'll get a you know something I've liked in the past enough to bother to save it off. And you have all these things. Everybody have all these things. Right? Did you change the, the display type from imagery or does your... Oh, yeah, okay, it's time to talk about display type. Yeah, just imagery is kind of the, the default when you do a formula. Probably Actually... Grids, formulas, formulas uh, grids, yeah, under grids, formulas, grids, maps, basic math. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, it is time to talk about the displays here. Um, you know, imagery, plan view. Again, the words, you got to sort of read and think about the words. Oh, imagery, it's kind of really for imagery. Plan views, a color shaded plan view is almost the same as an image. Only Tom tells me that images and grids are so different. Really, a color shaded plan view is kind of the same as an image. Um, but, you know, look at there, you could, we could make vertical cross sections. We could make uh, all kinds of things. Anyway, there's a lot, I think we can make 3D surfaces, we can make an ISO surface. Of relative vorticity or uh, whatever. So, um, so yeah, it does. It's worth thinking. You know, yeah, try them all out. Play with them. All right. So, all right. Let's make it a color shaded plan view instead of an image. And where was I again? Uh, I think my settings will still work. Oh, there's a relative vorticity, blue to red. Look at there. Yeah. Should have tried this last night. All right. So there's the formula. It's the Laplacian of what? The Laplacian of s. What's s? We need uh, geopotential heights. 3D grid. Your potential height. And uh, shall we say what level? Yeah, let's go to like 500 since the other thing is at fire. Let's go to 450 to avoid some trouble that I won't uh, make fun of. I won't tell you about. <laughs> You'll discover it someday. All right, 450 level. All right, there we go. Da, 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 da. Did it make it? Uh, yeah, where is it? Why isn't it there? 
God darn it. Oh, and it's because I did a Laplacian with scalar, and this thing has units. Uh, I might have mismatched the units. God darn it. So, uh, yeah, I should have tested this a little better. Will that help? Factor 10? No. Nah. Okay, let's go back and skip the, uh, you know, MAPES. I'm not sure how much to invest in these display settings. Let's, uh, let's uh, you know, let's let the thing build its own van vanilla display. Then we'll adjust the colors manually. So Laplacian of geopotential height at 450. There we go. Okay, and there's your generic, uh, there's your generic um, color scale that I don't quite love. Brian? So, yeah? Could we maybe just hit do a little reset and we can go right through what, what you just did? Because I think it went a little fast once you were picking what... Um, okay, what so I went back to field selector here. And some of those things were still there, right? We still had formulas selected. We still had the Laplacian selected. We still had a color shaded plan view selected. And all I did was, was uh, not use the special settings. So if you, if you created it with my special settings and got the special blank white <laughs> uh, no data, um, just go back and undo my, you know, skip, skip my settings. I guess just hit the top level, you know, unselect. Uh, that, and then just hit dis create display again, and it'll create another display. So it's the same thing, but it'll now make its own default color scale and, and range, and then we can sort out you know what the range should have been. Oh, now I can see what the range should have been. Um, and uh, so, so you could adjust that by hand, like going in here. If you click on any one of these things in the legend, any display in the legend, you get this whole bunch of controls about it, starting with color table. So I don't love that color table. Let's try to make it, um, let's make it uh, linear, but partly transparent, linear transparent. So let's make it an orange haze here. You can choose anything you want. I like these lurid uh, plastic looking colors for weird plastic uh, calculated quantities. Oh, okay, so, okay, so here we are, formulas, Laplacian operator, color shaded plan view, and nothing special under settings. If you, when you hit click create display, you get this, right? Yeah, there you go. So we're doing a Laplacian operator, and it's asking, what field should we do the Laplacian operation on? Oh. So under users BIM downloads, uh, this is a you know hothouse example. There's 3D grids. Oh, so does he have no data sets attached? Is that how this works? So you have no data sets attached anymore. You might, you might want to just start over. Uh, I mean, just re, you know, go to the yeah. I chose 450 because I wanted it to be above the pink stuff. So there it is. Above the pink stuff is, a, is kind of a key thing here. So, there, so there's the pink stuff. The pink stuff was absolute vorticity. I was already showing it to you. Look at there, the little Laplacian of the height field is kind of just like the pink stuff. Well, except it's big down here in the tropics, whereas the pink stuff is strong at the poles. Well, that's the F part of absolute vorticity, right? So this is relative vorticity. The orange is relative vorticity, really. Geostrophic relative vorticity. And the pink stuff is absolute vorticity. And uh, yeah, they're similar, but there's kind of a north-south gradient uh, in one of them. It's not in the other. And um, what happens if I turn the satellite data back on? Oh, the, pink, the, uh, the orange stuff disappeared. The orange stuff disappeared because that satellite data is kind of like blocking it. Even though it's transparent, it's sort of blocking it. This is a weird, this is just a weird uh, thing. So if you rotate it over here to the side, if you rotate over to the side, oh, that orange stuff's still under there. And that transparent satellite layer weirdly kind of blocks it. And uh, that's, just a, that's just an oddity of, um, of uh, 3D, Java 3D. So this is one of those little gotchas. 
Hey, how come it disappears? And that's because we rendered the orange thing after we'd already rendered the, the gray thing. So when you render a layer, it renders the transparent. You have to re-render a transparent layer to see all the stuff that's behind it. So the way to do that is um, in this satellite data here. You uh, you right-click or control uh, command click, sorry. And under view, there's this bring to front. This is a little buried. For how often I use this, I find this a little buried. Um, but anyway, it only matters if you do these 3D things. And, uh, but anytime you're going, Wait, where'd my display go? It might be hidden behind a transparent, hidden behind a transparent layer. I guess this is like Harry Potter's invisibility cloak or something. <laughs> so if I do this, I uh, bring the gray to the front. That'll re-render everything behind it. So building these 3D displays, this is the kind of pitfall in the build your own birdhouse from boards that, uh, that, uh, that's, that's a pain. And so it's nice to jump into a lovely 3D thing with a bunch of displays already and just add and subtract and tinker around that. You can learn just as much as you would from building up from scratch. And then, you, and then the pitfalls are, well, it's a pitfall in a pretty interesting situation already. And then you, then you learn the hard lessons you have to learn anyway. But um, this is my uh, spiel, I guess. How are we doing? Oh, we got lots of time. Let me, uh, okay, let's do another one of these. I, um, so I'm going to try and do live the same thing that's in the PowerPoint if any of you want to do this later or you're looking at the PowerPoint or whatever. So let's see. So we have, everybody made success at this level, right? It popped up and you have the sounding, you can drag it around. That's already pretty cool. Am I wrong? Us dragging around a sounding under a satellite uh, cloud image and seeing what the, you know, it's a model, but all right, there it is. Um, oh, let's make a 3D jet stream. All right. So the way you make anything always, uh, so as I told you, the upper left corner of the view uh, display is all about, you know, working on your view. When you want to make something new, you got to go off to the dashboard. Um, we're adding new railings to the birdhouse here. So you go off to the dashboard, and uh, uh, there's always kind of three steps. Choose some data. But we've already done that. We've loaded a bundle. There's already some data sets attached, unless you've closed them. Um, so really, we're just selecting fields, and uh, we're it, this field selector is the main, the main, uh, the main thing. So, so we were back here. We had these formulas. Let's make a jet stream, a 3D jet stream. One thing we could do is hope to find a formula called wind speed. Oh, speed from two components. So we could uh, make a wind speed and show it where u is and show it where v is and let it do the sum of the squares and the square root. But some of these are even more, um, even more uh, uh, well exposed in the GUI. And that is if you've got a 3D grid here that has u and v winds, it's got this packet of derived stuff that's just uh, always there. What is that? Ageostrophic horizontal advection. You know, dew point, flow vectors, geostrophic advection, blah, 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 blah. So many things. Everything you might want to go have to write, a, write a formula. Somebody's already written the formula, and the formulas are all tucked in here. Way down at the bottom there is speed from U and V. So isn't that nicer than having to, to dig it all up yourself? And all this, you know, bears reading. It's complicated, but it bears reading. You know, it's a tool. It's an offering. Uh, Okay, so, so we want to make a, we want to make like a 3D jet stream. So we want to make a 3D surface here of, of wind speed. So let's make that an ISO surface. I'm not going to get too fancy and color it by another parameter. Um, okay, so we're going to make a 3D surface. And uh, do we want that in the troposphere or all the way up through the stratosphere or what? We sort of have to... Brian? Yeah? Uh, so how does that take a step back? Like, the data that's the 2009 jet model and the yeah. Uh, you loaded that in with your bundle? Yeah, it came in with the bundle. So the bundle came in with data sets, including both satellite and, uh, and this model grid. And, uh, and that whole set of normal displays, the 500 millar heights and the pink vorticity, all that was just part of that bundle. Yeah, to point this to, and this is uh, happening a little bit in our textbook. Okay, so let me just, uh, let's, let's veer off for a second here from the building the jet stream. Let's say I wanted to look at some other data. In fact, this, is a, this was a forecast model in when? 2009. Um, 
forecast model in 2009, we could see what really happened. We, have, we could find a reanalysis for this date. So you know what I love is uh, under my data set only IDV bundles here, under um, sub daily, you know, instantaneous kind of data, look at all those. Yeah, MAPES IDV collection, data set only IDV bundles, and uh, sub daily, because we're looking at, you know, instantaneous data here, not monthly averages or what, right? Uh, and my big favorite is uh, MARA. Let's see if we can do MARA's 3D state. And, uh, okay, measure twice, cut once. Shall I remove all displays and data when I pull in this new data set? Yes. No, I shall not. <laughs> all right. Try to add displays to current windows. Sure, it doesn't matter. There aren't any displays. This is a data set only bundle. Change data paths, no match display region. Anyway, so this is one of those uh, Simon says, don't remove everything as you try to add one more thing. <laughs> it's a sharp knife on a uh, counter in a house with a baby. And I've cut my, and I've been that baby many times, many times. <laughs> but okay, so look at there, I added that uh, 3D grids. Derived. Wow, we could look at the wind speed from Mara. Now here's another uh, don't cut your hand. Look at those times. 1979 01010000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
which you have to again bring to front in order to re again render everything behind it, which you didn't. But it's there. Uh, what level is what? Uh, it is a, this is a three-dimensional isosurface. That's sort of the whole point of it. Where's my, well, how come my darn mouse doesn't work here? Ah, there we go. How come my darn mouse, ah, there we go. Yeah, that's a, that's a 3D thing. Yeah, so there's our, the orange, remember, was 450 millibars. The other stuff was 500 millibars. So this is all above 450 millibars is the jet stream, kind of along the ceiling of the tropopause there. Yeah, so that's pretty neat. It's an isosurface, so really uh, it should all be the same color because it's, uh, it's an isosurface. But uh, you can see it's a little greenish, it's got a little greenish in, t in the yellow. I don't know, that's just within the bugs of Java. I, I always like isosurfaces to kind of be a, um, to be kind of a single color. So let's, uh, let's recolor it again. You click on it, you get whatever controls it has. You can have, you know, what value it is, 50 meters per second in this case. And you could burrow in and change, uh, change color scales to all kinds of things. Sometimes I just like a solid color. Uh, let's make it green. I don't know. Ah, darn it. There we go. Yeah. Nice lurid green. Everybody able to do that if they cared to? Why not? <laughs> Yeah, perfect timing, right? Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, this is all harder than it looks, isn't it? But it's a lot easier with my little uh, layer of helpy helps, I'm claiming. Uh, yeah, and uh, do you have any idea why his data disappeared? But anyway, I'll, we'll sort that out in a minute, because that, anyway, that's a one-minute fix. I don't know what happened. All right. So in case all this worked, I was going to say, oh, you know, hi, yeah, okay, change colors, make it transparent. Oh, very lurid. This is where, uh, yeah, you need a visual grammar. What are you trying to express here exactly? Um, uh, yeah, okay. Good. Play on. All right, so, uh, well, uh, yeah, let's wrap this up, shall we? Uh, maybe I have the only one thing left to say about this um, this feeling of maybe shifting ground. That uh, here's a here's a lovely bit of infrastructure, you know, infrastructure planning, architecture, engineering, implementation. Uh, but it's all in Java, which is old. And Python is new. Uh, but there's Jython. Maybe right. Maybe we don't have to throw away. The, maybe the old can call the new, and the new can call the old. Just as um, you know, Kayak calls Expedia, and Expedia calls Kayak, and you get both, we go to either site, and you get both, and they can both stay in business, and they're both brokering each other, and they're, all give, they're both giving you all the services of everyone. There's, this is not a game of Go, where one side surrounds the other, captures it, and whoosh, sweeps the floor. It is not commercial, maybe commercial is that way. But uh, I don't know if you know the game of Go, you're always trying to surround each other. Is, it back, is black about to surround white, or is white about to surround black? This is the, the year by year kind of shifting uh, sands of what language is on the ascendancy and what's the, and uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm looking for mergers here, not um, not throw out the old. Um, and uh, who who said this yesterday? Was that Steve Lazarus? Says he's anxiously awaiting PyDV 1.0. Yeah, one of you. Anyway, I too. <laughs> I too am desperately hoping that all this activity in Unidata turns into. PyDV 1.0, and uh, we got some postdocs to help, and uh, but uh, we don't know the deep down Java amongst us, but uh, open for PyDV. Okay, thank you.